Good evening, everyone. Uh, last September, the Huntington welcomed Dr. Karen R. Lawrence as its ninth president. President Lawrence is a gifted administrator and an inspirational leader, something that is well in evidence during these first months of her presidency. For a decade, she served as president of Sarah Lawrence College, a top liberal arts college in Yonkers, New York, which has a deep commitment to the humanities and to the creative and performing arts. She led Sarah Lawrence through the 2008 financial crisis, moving the institution into a period of strong growth and performance, as well as increased student body diversity. President Lawrence led the most successful fundraising campaign in the college's history, culminating in the building of the Barbara Walters Campus Center, which represents the largest gift in Sarah Lawrence's history from one of its most famous alumni. Her Huntington Post marks a return to Southern California for President Lawrence, where from 1998 to 2007, she led the School of Humanities at the University of California, Irvine. Throughout her career, she has been a forceful advocate for the liberal arts, and she currently serves on the board of the National Humanities Center in the Research Triangle in North Carolina. What the Huntington community has had less opportunity to experience are President Lawrence's deep accomplishments as a widely respected scholar and teacher of English and Irish literature, though I can vouch that she is a great favorite among library staff who have had the pleasure of working with her in the collections. President Lawrence is a magna cum laude graduate of Yale University with an MA from Tufts University, and she was awarded the PhD with distinction from Columbia University. President Lawrence is considered one of an elite cadre of experts on the work of Irish novelist, poet, and literary critic, James Joyce. She is a past president of the International James Joyce Foundation, as well as the Society of Narrative Literature. Her acclaimed book, the Odyssey of Style in Ulysses, first published by Princeton University Press in 1981, traces Joyce's abandonment of a narrative norm in favor of a series of rhetorical masks regarded as conscious aesthetic experiments and considers the theoretical implications of this process for both the writing and the reading of novels. In 1998, she edited and contributed to the volume Transcultural Joyce, also published by Cambridge University Press, assembling a group of leading international scholars who assessed the afterlife of Joyce and his writings within a multinational context, reflecting on how Joyce's borderline cultural position complicates his reception, revision, and translation by later writers from Latin, Latin America to Europe and to China. The 2010 University Press of, Flor University Press of Florida volume, Who's Afraid of James Joyce?, collects President Lawrence's writings on Joyce from over a number of years. As one reviewer says of this book, it stands as an essential resource for new generations of Joyce critics looking to build on Lawrence's immense contributions to the field. The glittering intelligence of the individual pieces in this collection reminds us that each time Lawrence returns to Joyce's body of work, she manages not just to extract a creative reading, but to develop a fundamentally new way of approaching these immensely influential stories and novels. So after this evening, I expect everyone in the room will know why President Lawrence sails about the Huntington grounds on a mighty golf cart dubbed by her admirers on staff, the Odyssey. President Lawrence will be speaking to us this evening on James Joyce or how good writers borrow, great writers steal. Please join me in welcoming Huntington President, Dr. Karen Lawrence. Sandy, thank you very much and welcome. It's um, a real honor to deliver 
the annual Founders Day lecture to you tonight. Uh, in framing my talk, I imagine there's quite an individual variation among you in terms of your familiarity with James Joyce. Some of you may have studied Joyce in college. <laughs> Some of you may know of, or even have consulted, the Huntington Library's very fine Joyce collection acquired as part of the John Hinsdale Thompson papers in 1974. And some of you might have read Ulysses just for pleasure. <laughs> Yet despite the fact that the board of Random House called Ulysses the most influential book of the 20th century, it's also been called the greatest book most people have not read. So some of you may be among the many people who have heard of it, tried to read it, and given up. Tonight, I welcome the chance to tell you something about why I've spent a good deal of my life and career reading, studying, writing about, and teaching Joyce, particularly Ulysses. In some ways, I could say Joyce made me do it. He's famously quoted as boasting, I've put in so many enigmas and puzzles, it will keep the professors busy for centuries, arguing over what I meant, and that's the only way to ensure immorality. Oh, no, I did it again. <laughs> this lecture, um, which I've loved giving, has, ha, and where I've read the quotes, um, has been given a couple of times. This is, my, this is my third time. And the first time I said immorality, and the second time I said immortality, which it is, and now I said immorality again. So let me clarify, it's ensuring Joyce's immortality, okay? <laughs> Once and for all. I first read Ulysses in college in an undergraduate course on the epic tradition in which, by the way, we read the Odyssey, the Aeneid, the Inferno, Don Quixote, and Ulysses in a single semester. <laughs> and although I was really captivated by the brilliance of my teachers, I felt that they failed to mention one aspect of the novel that readers experienced in reading it. And that was, as Sandy mentioned, the abrupt changes of narrative style over the course of the novel. Sorry. Um, so that insight led me to my doctoral dissertation and my thesis, which became my first book, The Odyssey of Style in Ulysses. For many years, more dissertations were supposedly written on James Joyce than on anybody but Shakespeare. And I was told at the time, and kind of warned, that working in such a crowded field as Joyce studies might be a kind of academic suicide. But I was hooked on Joyce. Even as I've taken on more administrative roles, I've tried to continue to read, write about, and teach Joyce's works. At Sarah Lawrence, I taught a Joyce course a few times during the time I was president. And I always called the course, Who's Afraid of James Joyce? Because I think many people are. But I should explain that while in my experience, most people are initially afraid of reading Ulysses, when they encounter it in a group or a class, they wind up being more exhilarated than intimidated. Just last week at the invitation of a Joyce friend, Kevin Detmer, who's a faculty member at Pomona, um, I, he, guessed, inv he invited me to guest teach his seminar on Ulysses, and I had the pleasure of doing that. Uh, and like my students at Sarah Lawrence, the Pomona students were fearless. In fact, for many years, I was president of a group of Joyceans, yes, it is a noun, who belonged to the James Joyce Foundation, again, Sandy mentioned that, which sponsors symposia every two years, at which about six or 700 people gather together to discuss, 
present papers about, and also uh, perform Joyce's work. Many of you may know that the 644 or so pages of Ulysses record events during one day in the lives of its three main Dublin characters, Stephen Dedalus, Leopold Bloom, and Bloom's wife, Molly. That one day is June 16, 1904. So at every symposium, both academic and non-academic Joyceans come together on June 16, better known as Bloom's Day, thank you, in honor of Leopold Bloom, to celebrate the day on which the book takes place. In 1982, when my husband Peter and I attended the symposium in Dublin, everybody who was anybody in Ireland was there. Carol O'Connor, Burgess Meredith, Seamus Haney. And just to make the celebration more fun, the local pubs offered a pint of Guinness at 1904 prices. <laughs> Actors dressed up, enacting the comings and goings of the characters through the Dublin streets. This celebration of Bloomsday, which in some form now occurs on June 16th through many cities around the world, is, I think, an amazing testament to Joyce's imagination. It's not a celebration of a writer's birthday, like Shakespeare's birthday, or a death day of a writer, which sometimes is celebrated in Europe. It's a celebration of a fictional day created so compellingly by James Joyce. So what is so compelling about this writer? Why would Garland Press in the 1970s decide to publish a whopping 63 volumes of the James Joyce archive, including reproductions of nearly all of the existing Joyce notebooks, manuscripts, typescripts, and proofs known at the time? And why, when additional manuscripts and notebooks were discovered in 2001, would the National Library of Ireland pay $11.7 million to acquire them? There's an interesting story about this involving a friend of mine, which I'm happy to tell you about during Q&A if we have time. So let me answer these questions for you personally and professionally. Joyce has one of the most capacious imaginations of any writer I've ever encountered. Ulysses is a novel of grand sweep, epic ambition, and mythic proportions. Yet Joyce's grand sweep is matched by his almost obsessive attention to the smallest, most idiosyncratic, ordinary details of life, rendered in astonishing language. I think the impulse to capture both that sweep and the ordinary details of life and to dare to push the boundaries of language marks all of Joyce's fiction and has contributed to keeping all the professors busy. And we're also fascinated by the process as well as the results of his experiments in language. Even in his early short story collection, Dubliners, whose prose is succinct and spare, Joyce combined an ambition to represent his countrymen and to create linguistic surprises. Joyce wrote in a style he called scrupulous meanness. And he said, in composing of my chapter of moral history in exactly the way I've composed it, I've taken the first step toward the spiritual liberation of my country. So I think the enigmas and puzzles in Dubliners are different from Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake. They result from what's deliberately omitted, from what's not said, rather than from a profusion of details and illusions. In a portrait of the artist as a young man as well, Joyce's purpose was ambitious, to represent the very conscience of his country as expressed in the words of his protagonist, would-be artist Stephen Dedalus. Welcome, O life, I go to create the uncreated conscience of my race. 
this bold intention to present and expose his country and countrymen in the most honest and exacting way in his work made publishers extremely wary. Dubliners, which Joyce began in 1904, was published in 1914. A portrait, too, faced obstacles. Even as Joyce dedicated himself to representing his city and his country to the world, he felt he could not be an artist and continue to live in Ireland. As Stephen Dedalus says in Ulysses, the Irish artist in colonial Ireland serves two masters, England and Rome, the British Empire and the Catholic Church. In 1904, at the age of 22, and before either Dubliners or a portrait was finished, Joyce left Ireland, returning only three times. So he left for good in 1912. Well, he continued to write about Ireland his whole life, for the rest of his life, as he lived in self-imposed exile from it. And you can see the cities in Europe where he lived. But increasingly, as he continued to write about Ireland, his canvas expanded, and he stole plots, characters, styles, even languages from all over the world and from all over literature. By the time he wrote Finnegan's Wake, his novel about a Dublin pub keeper and his family, Joyce attempted to include all of human history, a startling range of myths, as well as over 50 languages. This elusiveness and multiplicity of languages baffled readers, reviewers, even other artists alike. The French artist, César Hébin, captured this transcultural, translinguistic Joyce as a question mark hovering over the whole world. And you can see uh, on the right that I used this illustration. I didn't steal it. I got permission for it for the cover of my edited book, Transcultural Joyce. And one prospective reviewer, upon receiving a copy of Finnegan's Wake in the mail to review, wrote the following to the publisher. Please tell the office manager to be more careful when he sends books out to read. I'm the English language reader, and you sent me a book written in some other godforsaken language. I'm returning it under separate cover. <laughs> Joyce's multilinguistic practice was, I think, not only literary, but also political. I cannot express myself in English without enclosing myself in a tradition, he said. I'm at the end of English. Finnegan's Wake was Joyce's last work, published in 1939. It took 17 years to write. Ulysses, written and published in book form first in 1922, took eight years and was written in three cities, Trieste, Zurich, and Paris, largely during World War I. It's important to point out that when he began writing his encyclopedic representation of one day, 18 hours, in the life of his Dublin characters in Ulysses, Joyce was remembering Dublin from abroad and a decade away from the time frame of the book, which was June 16th, 1904. This distance from his city and his country is registered on the final page of every Random House edition of Ulysses, which reads, as you can see, Trieste, Zurich, Paris, 1914 to 1921. About presenting a complete portrait of his city to the world, which he wanted to do, Joyce famously told his friend, the painter Frank Budgeon, I want to give a picture of Dublin so complete that if the city one day suddenly disappeared from the earth, it could be reconstructed out of my book. Now, this description sounds like a desire to achieve a height of realism, a desire to write a thick novelistic description of characters in a specific time and a specific place. And indeed, the Dublin of 1904 in Joyce's novel 
Here's Sackville Street, Nelson's Pillar, the general post office with hackney cars and horse-drawn wagons. These are found in Ulysses. It's this Dublin that is created on the 600 pages of Ulysses, devoted to the 18 hours in the lives of Stephen Dedalus, Leopold Bloom, and Molly, and other Dubliners. But ironically, in backdating his novel to 1904, Joyce created a Dublin that had already disappeared. Through time and human violence, it was a different city by 1921 when he finished writing Ulysses. This is Sackville Street after the 1916 Easter uprising in Dublin. This Irish violence and the war in Europe, raging as Joyce wrote, appear obliquely in Ulysses, which supposedly takes place in 1904. And it appears in such passages from, as in this one in chapter eight, where Bloom's thoughts register in highly poetic prose the continual erasure of his city. City full passing away, other city full coming, passing away too, other coming on, passing on, houses, lines of houses, streets, miles of pavements, pavements, piled up bricks, stones, changing hands. And now, through that prism, Joyce's desire to give a picture of Dublin so complete that if it disappeared, it could be reconstructed from his book, now seems less about holding a mirror up to nature than it does about resurrecting through language a world that's perpetually on the verge of disappearance. And in fact, at the end of the 19th century, archeological discovery showed that civilizations had disappeared from the earth. In the 1870s, shortly before Joyce's birth, Heinrich Schliemann discovered the remnants of the city of Troy, memorialized in history and in Homer's epic, The Iliad. With these excavations, archeologists reconstructed an ancient civilization through the forensic clues provided by pots, masks, fragmentary details. Joyce would have known of this excavation, and in some ways his own method mimics the archeological impulse to resurrect the past object by object. And if you've read Ulysses, there are many things in it, and it's, it's clotted with the details of materials in, uh, around and in the environment. But Joyce wasn't just inspired by the literal excavation of Troy. Writing within the epic tradition, he based his own modern Irish epic, Ulysses, on Homer's poems about the Trojan War, specifically the Odyssey. So he explicitly acknowledged his debt to the Odyssey in now, a now famous remark, again to Frank Budgeon. I'm now writing a book, said Joyce, based on the wanderings of Ulysses, the Odyssey that is to me serves, that is to say, serves me as a ground plan. Only my time is recent time, and all my hero's wanderings take no more than 18 hours. Of course, Joyce also refers to the Odyssey through his title Ulysses, which is the Latin name for Odysseus. He acknowledges both the similarities and the differences between his own work and the model that he uses. He flaunts, really flaunts, both the way that he repeats even steals from Homer, and the way he alters his models in translating his hero's wanderings to Ireland. In two charts that he provided to different friends, he explicitly acknowledges that the very structure of Ulysses is based on the tripartite structure of Homer's epic. The first section, Stephen's Morning, is Joyce's Telemachia. The second, his Odyssey of Leopold Bloom Odysseus. And the third is the homecoming or Nostos. Bloom Odysseus's return, I'm sorry, of the Nostos, which is Bloom's return to his home, such as it is. 
Interestingly, the chapter titles in the chart, and you can see them there, Telemachus, Nestor, Proteus, uh, Penelope, refer to episodes in the Odyssey. But after calling the novel and titling it Ulysses, Joyce decided not to leave the chapter titles in the book. So they're referred to that way by people reading Joyce or who know about Joyce or who study Joyce, but they're not actually in the text. Structures, characters, motifs, episodes are stolen and Joyce uses them in his own way. For example, Molly Bloom, beset by suitors like Homer's faithful Penelope, decides to have an affair with a lover on this day. Explicitly and implicitly, Joyce acknowledges what I would call the ecology of his creation, that he's recycling plots, characters, and civilization of the past, both borrowing and stealing. But Homer is not his only model. The epic itself as a genre is inclusive, expansive, and very durable. It's a poem about the life of a community, a political poem. Think of the Aeneid as, and the, found, the story of the founding of Rome. In choosing to write an epic, Joyce was choosing to steal from his precursors and show that they are his guides. The first six books of the Aeneid are based on the Odyssey, the second about uh, the Aeneid. The, um, sorry, and in Dante's Divine Comedy, Vir Virgil, the poet, is Dante the Pilgrim's guide. In fact, the epic impulse means to rewrite, repeat, and recycle. For Joyce, all of literature, not just the epic, works that way. You create your own signature out of plots that have been recited before, because that's how life works and literature too. So, Stephen Dedalus in Ulysses is Telemachus and Hamlet. Leopold Bloom or Poldy is both Odysseus and the ghost of King Hamlet. Molly is Penelope, Beatrice from the Divine Comedy, and Queen Gertrude in Hamlet. What Joyce acknowledged in ransacking the literature of the past was that human plots repeat themselves in every tradition. All stories have cousins, even if they're not identical twins. All stories, they're all stories of love, loss, fidelity, rivalry, a quest for knowledge, betrayal, confrontation with one's mortality, and all of them are ghost stories. My title, if truth be told, is itself a paraphrase that I borrowed or stole from an essay by T.S. Eliot. My point is that paradoxically, it was through stealing and shamelessly recycling the works of his predecessors that Joy Joyce forged his unique style. By the time he wrote Finnegan's Wake, Joyce had converted his style into a recycling machine. He advertised his theft within the very prose of the novel itself. He called Finnegan's Wake, within Finnegan's Wake, the phrase appears, the last word in stolen telling. And he gave other clues about how borrowed and stolen uh, his work was. Sophocles, can I hear some audience participation? Who's that? Sophocles. Shakespeare, um, Nora Joyce was supposed to have said, uh, there's only one writer he's got to get the better of, and that's that Shakespeare. So Shakespeare. Pseudodonto, Anonymosis. Moses and Anonymous even got there before Joyce in this. Um, so he called Finnegan's Wake a comedy of letters. He fused writers, languages, precursors in a wholly different linguistic stew. Now, as I prepared for this Founders Day talk, I was treated uh, to a tour of our own Joyce Holdings in the Thompson Collection by Carla Nielsen, our curator of literary collections. And I was very grateful and excited to, um, to leave my office and go in the Amundsen Reading Room. And I've had the incredible pleasure of doing that to consult Joyce's materials. 
I like my office, it's a great office, but this was um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of fun to go in and actually look at the Ulysses collection. And I was thrilled to look at a 20-page portion of the last chapter of Ulysses, Molly Bloom's chapter, with Joyce's corrections, as you can see, in his own hand. And uh, a significant 10-word addition to the text on this particular page. But if our collection includes fascinating materials from Joyce's archive, including manuscripts and some handwritten letters, which it does, and some very fine first editions, it also actually demonstrates the existential threats to his legacy that Joyce continually faced. I mentioned previously Joyce's extreme difficulties in getting all his work published, especially Ulysses. While he was still composing the chapters of Ulysses, he found two courageous women. Joyce was always helped by women throughout his life. He found two women, Margaret Anderson and Jane Heap, to publish the chapters in installments in an American journal called The Little Review, published in New York. Our library has the full run of those 14 chapters of Ulysses that were published in the Little Review between 1918 and 1920, whereupon the postal authorities confiscated the journal copies and the government sued Anderson and Heap for publishing obscenity. And they lost the case and they were fined and they couldn't publish Ulysses anymore. So for more than 10 years, Ulysses didn't appear legally in an English-speaking country. Another woman came to Joyce's rescue to publish Ulysses in book form in 1922. You may have heard of Sylvia Beach, owner of the bookstore Shakespeare and Company in Paris. And here's a great photo, a lovely photo of Joyce and Beach. You can see the text at the left says, and I'm just going to read an excerpt. In February 1921, the Little Review was ordered by a court in New York to stop publication of Ulysses on the grounds of obscenity. The following month, Joyce stepped disconsolately into Sylvia's bookshop and announced, my book will never come out now, to which Sylvia replied, would you let Shakespeare and Company have the honor of bringing out your Ulysses? And Ulysses was published on Joyce's birthday, February 2nd. The second rescue you may have heard of occurred in 1933, which is also well known, when Bennett Cerf and Random House um, went to court in the US uh, to argue and to have the right to publish Ulysses. And this time the novel was declared more art than obscenity and in 1934, uh, Random House was able to publish Ulysses. Ironically, our Thompson collection includes further evidence of an existential threat to the Joyce legacy. The pirated edition of Chapters of Ulysses, published by Samuel Roth in his Two Worlds Monthly from 1926 to 27. Known for publishing sexually explicit materials, Roth brazenly advertised his unauthorized publication. You can see that at the top. But this was a form of stolen telling that infuriated Joyce, and he sought and received an injunction against Roth. And I think it was something like 160 writers signed a petition also protesting this pirated edition. In doing my small part to keep Joyce's legacy alive, I've been really fortunate to have received two very special gifts from members of my family. And th this is um, a picture that I took from, in my, from my shrine, my joy shrine in my office. Uh, on your left, on the bottom, is an exceptionally fine copy of the first illustrated edition of Ulysses, illustrated by Henri Matisse. 
and it was given to me by my parents on my 40th birthday, and is one of only 250 copies of the book signed by both Matisse and Joyce. So it's a real thrill. The second is a photograph of Joyce, um, one of the most iconic pictures of the late Joyce. And um, it was done by Berenice Abbott, it was taken by Berenice Abbott, who took many pictures in Paris of writers in the 1920s. And this was given to me by my husband, Peter, and is also a very special present. And I love that his hands are, I mean, it's a wonderful picture of Joyce's hands. He was almost blind at that time. And um, I cherish that too. And I feel like Joyce has come with me to three institutions as I've moved, and I feel like he's watching over us all. Uh, so let me close this Founders Day talk with a description of Joyce's significance by the French writer André Gide that I've always found um, very telling and, and beautiful. It's not difficult to be bold when one is young. The finest audacity is that of the end of life. I admire it in Joyce as I've admired it in Mallarmé, in Beethoven, and in some very rare artists whose work terminates in a cliff and who present to the future the steepest face of their genius, never allowing the imperceptible slope by which they've patiently reached that disconcerting height to be known. I hope I've given you a glimpse of that Joycean audacity and genius in this Founders Day on this occasion and of my own very personal passion developed over a lifetime. But let me end <laughs> this way. Uh, this is the James Joyce pub on the left in Zurich. It was originally in Dublin and it was going to be torn down. And a another friend, uh, a scholar named uh, Fritz Sen, who is Swiss and worked for a bank, convinced the bank in Switzerland to have shipped panel by panel, beautiful wood panel by wood panel to Switzerland, to Zurich, the James Joyce pub, where it still is now and where we've celebrated a few uh, Bloom's Days. And so uh, there it is on the left. And uh, so here's my hope uh, that wherever you are on June 16th, you celebrate Bloom's Day, and maybe we can even have a pint or a bottle or give a toast to Joyce with some Guinness at the Huntington. Thank you. Be happy to take a couple of questions if you have them. Mm -hmm. um, if you could, not being a literature person, in, the, in his impact, it was, or is his technique so startling that that particular point in time when he first, that uh, I know it's affected everything else? It was just that, uh, a while back, uh, about 10 years ago, I read it. I, you know, I assume that uh, uh, the guy was, you know, that so much of what he had done has already been observed in our history and so on and so what I read. But I have never understood why the impact. Okay, did everyone hear that? Why the impact? What was the impact of Joyce? I mean, was it really so different? Um, and I think it was, and it had, a it had a profound impact. First, the Gide quote is really interesting in talking about a slope. So Dubliners was different from other things in a different way from Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake. So Dubliners was a little like, uh, Dubliners almost, I, I would say, modernized the short stro story form. Borrowed some from Chekhov. But instead of writing a, a story with a kind of beginning, middle, and an end, it was based on what Joyce called epiphanies, sudden moments. So they're very, they're, um, 
they're, they're beautiful stories, they're succinctly written, but you, you kind of say, what are they doing? And, and so my point is that at every phase, he did something surprising uh, to kind of change the genre that he was working in. Um, portrait of the artist as a young man, there had been other artist portraits. There, there were other novels of the artist, Kunstel Romans. But what he did was he started it uh, in a language that mimics nursery rhymes and childhood stories. In other words, he started writing about the artist as a young man, as a young person, and the language itself was almost like a nursery rhyme. And then it, and then it develops. So in every genre, he was kind of pushing that genre. And I've talked about Ulysses, and I've talked about Finnegan's Wake, which were so influential. You, you ask a great question, though. So writers were very influenced by Joyce. Transcultural Joyce was kind of about how that worked. But um, Henry Roth was an American writer who wrote, I, I think, a terrific book called Call It Sleep. And then he read Ulysses, and he didn't write another book for 40 years. <laughs> He had writer's block, and he, and, he, and he blamed Ulysses because he said, what could you do with a novel after you read Ulysses? The good part of this is that he, he's near the end of his life. He wrote a trilogy uh, after that, so he kind of recovered from that. But Joyce was not always generating. It was also you know, a kind of daunting model that he presented with that steep face of genius. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, I love the Calypso chapter. I don't have my chart up. It's the fourth chapter. So the Telemachia are the first three chapters on Stephen Dedalus. And Joyce once said, Stephen Dedalus has a shape that can't be changed. And I kind of felt like after reading Portrait, where Steve how many people have read Portrait of the Artist? Wow. <laughs> Um, so Stephen continues in Ulysses. How many people have read Ulysses? Great. Um, okay, well then Calypso is my favorite chapter, and that'll mean uh, something, but it's the fourth chapter. So after Stephen Dedalus, who continues to appear, but is philosophizing, and the Proteus chapter is a very erudite, abstruse philosophical chapter, which is interesting. You turn the page, and there's Leopold Bloom. And it's the first time you meet him. And it says something like, Leopold Bloom ate with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls. <laughs> he liked the, the now, now I'm going to, but it's about the, the taste of kidneys and the faint smell of urine as you read. Anyway, um, you might not find this the most compelling writing, but <laughs> after you turn the, chap, the, the page from Stephen to Bloom, it's uh, like a wonderful new beginning. And in fact, I, I mentioned that Joyce did 18 hours in the lives of his characters. So the first three hours are from 8 to 11 in Stephen Bloom, uh, Stephen Dedalus. And then Calypso starts, rewinds the novel. I mean, that's weird too. Rewinds the novel and begins again at 8 o'clock with Leopold Bloom. And they have certain parallels and connections. They both at the same time see a cloud cover the sun. But you get such a different perspective with Bloom than with Stephen that um, it's my favorite chapter because it's just a wonderful new, new beginning. The, one other thing that I didn't talk about um, is that the interior monologue which is the recording of inner thoughts, which was very unusual, another very unusual thing that Joyce did. Other writers did it in different ways, but it was really uh, different. Records the sound of people thinking and all their idiosyncrasies. And the interior monologue is a kind of profoundly democratic technique. It says that ordinary people are worth spending time with in their minds. And, um, and they're, worth, they're worth spending pages of a novel on. And again, that was, I think, in Calypso was, was something that was really kind of a revelation. Uh-huh. He wrote in the stream of consciousness. This is his style. And I was wondering, do we know of any other books that have been written in that style? 
So the question was, he wrote in Stream of Consciousness, do I know of any other books that were written in that style? And the phrase I used, interior monologue, is kind of a synonym for Stream of Consciousness. So it was a, a way that you can re purportedly record what's in somebody, the sound of somebody thinking. Um, I think Virginia Woolf, uh, whom I also love as a modern writer and was Joyce's, was born in the same year as Joyce, also was a genius at capturing people thinking. It was a, it was a different technique, um, which is kind of almost like a disembodied consciousness that flows in and out of different people's minds. So it was different from Joyce, but I think they were both working on something similar. And, and Virginia Woolf wrote about let the atoms fall where they may, recording the everyday moments of life. So both of them, and Virginia Woolf wrote um, a novel that also took place on only one day. Does anybody know what it is? Mrs. Dalloway, yes. Mrs. Dalloway. So it's called a circadian novel, like your circadian rhythms, and it means a, a novel that take places, takes place on one day. And I think Wolf was also really trying to get at not a novel that's about war or about the dramatic parts of life, but both of them wanted to capture what it, what it feels, what daily life feels like in the modern world. Okay. What did he steal from Cervantes? Um, great question, and that was one of those epics that, that I actually did read in that in a college course as On the Way to Ulysses. Oh, let's see. Um, well, you know, part of these generic plots uh, the romance plot, the, I mean, Cervantes, Don Quixote was all about somebody who um, is so compelled by literature that he goes out and thinks he's a knight. I mean, that it's, it's all about the power of, of stories to affect you. And I think Joyce was also dealing in that kind of, I mean, everything that I've been saying about basing th your, your own literature on previous literature, that's what Cervantes did. Um, and I think that that was that kind of parodic aspect of uh, basing your own work on a previous novel and repeating it in a different way was very uh, Cervantes-like in Joyce. Could I what? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. How many people have read Finnegan's Wake? Oh, okay, here. How many people have read Finnegan's Wake? <laughs> I better stop now, it's not my book. Thank you very much. <laughs>